It all started back in 1965 when Lockheed recognized that there was going to be a market for a new airplane. This was based upon market analyses that indicated uh, an increase of about 10 to 11 percent per year or approximately five times in the coming decade in commercial air travel. The airlines had been studying this problem themselves for some time. And in their planning departments, they recognized the fact that they needed new aircraft. With this in mind, uh, funding was allocated for a quick look to see what the airplane might look like. Our initial studies were all for uh, twin engine airplanes with a range of approximately uh, San Francisco to Chicago as the maximum. But the problem is an economic one. If you want to reduce the cost of flying a passenger in one seat, you have to put a lot of people in the box. And after a lot of studies, we decided that the airplane ought to have about 220 passengers in it. As time went on, and the airlines, including Eastern and other airlines, were studying the problem with us, they felt that they might want to use the airplane as sort of a backup to the 747 on night flights, for instance, and uh, they felt that the airplane ought to have a minimum capability to fly transcontinentally. But if you study the problem from an engineer's viewpoint and you put 220 or 30 people in the box with two engines, remember now, if one engine fails, the other engine has to keep the airplane flying, and if he's over the Rocky Mountains, he has to maintain a minimum altitude. So as our design progressed, we decided to go to three engines instead of two. This permitted us to travel over greater ranges, to have a greater operational flexibility, and particularly permitted us to operate over water. Basically, a new airplane usually starts in preliminary design. This airplane had pretty much the same beginning, except that it had a, a totally different premise for its outcome than any other plane that I've ever worked on. Instead of operating the way we did in the past where the aerodynamicists and the propulsion people would put together a configuration and then they would give it to the interior design department and say now put some seats and some chairs in it and make it for passengers. This one went the other way around. They said let's design this first for people and we'll build the airplane around it. What really establishes the diameter of the fuselage? One of the factors is the serving tray width that, uh, that you have in front of you when you eat your meal on the airplane. I know it was important to us on the 1011 because we decided to install an underfloor galley in the airplane and prepare the food down there and serve it to the passenger in a cart. And the tray size thereby established the width of the cart. And we had to push the cart down the aisle and we had to have three or four inches to slide by the cart. So that established the width of the aisle. We had to make the seats at least as wide as the coach seats in the 747 or the passengers wouldn't have been satisfied. And when we decided on eight seats across the airplane, it really just added up to the total width of the airplane. The big thing that you have to shoot for is to make Airline Joe, the passenger, happy from the time he walks into that airplane and sits down and orders his first drink from the stewardess until he deplanes at his destination. And that's a task that the manufacturer and the airline share. And of course the airplane itself has to be a winner. The secret of good aerodynamic development is having a very good wind tunnel. And what we do in the wind tunnel, of course, is we develop the proper wing size, the airfoil shape, the sweep angle, the uh, configuration of the front end of these big fuselages and the back end. We measure the control effectiveness and we size the tail and we establish the balance for the airplane. And we bet our, <laughs> we really bet our whole future on our knowledge of the accuracy of that wind tunnel. There is an interesting gap between the design of an airplane, which is theoretical, and the actual manufacturing of the airplane so that it rolls out and starts to take passengers. And we fill this particular gap. 
We take the pieces of hardware, the first ones as they're designed, and we find out whether they behave in exactly the way that the designer said they would behave. The obvious ones are large pieces like the main landing gear and the nose landing gear, huge portions of the fuselage and wings. We test these both by hanging heavy weights on them to see how far we can go before they break. We also put loads on that fluctuate continuously rather in the way that they do when we're actually flying. This is known as what we call fatigue testing. This is to determine the life of the airplane, how long it's going to last. One of the things that we knew we were going to have to offer in the airplane, the airlines demanded it, was a new type of structure that somehow would lick this bugaboo of structural aging. And we gave it an awful lot of consideration at Lockheed, and we're quite proud of the result. I can tell you that the structure in the L-1011 is designed for infinite life. You know, an ideal airplane would have no joints or rivets in it. It would be just like it was squeezed out of a toothpaste tube. Well, we couldn't do that, but we gave a lot of attention to using very large pieces of skin on the airplane. And if you've looked at our fuselage, or when you look at it in service, you'll notice that it has very large panels on it. The concept that we developed structurally of the airplane, of our bonding of the fuselage, I think represents more to the airlines in the way of lifelong service. There's a gentleman that we have who is an ex-aerodynamicist. In this area, this bonding of the fuselage has been his specialty. Some time back, they asked, how do you describe how strong that fuselage is to a layman? He says, I'll tell you what, he says, you get me a new automobile, a big one, one that's good looking. And he says, I'll take one square inch of this fuselage structure, and we'll get a great big hoist, and we'll take this one square inch bond structure, and we'll attach that to the car, and we'll lift the automobile up. He says, how's that grab you? The Lockheed TriStar has a fully automatic landing system. This means, in essence, that the aircraft itself finds its way to the runway accurately and descends to the proper point of the runway accurately without any external assistance from the pilot. There's a built-in capability of doing this. This has a lot of implications for the passenger. For one thing, it means the aircraft can land safely under very bad weather conditions, which at the moment would mean rerouting to some small airport and taking a bus and arriving home three hours late. You'll actually be able to land under those circumstances with this aircraft. The engine we chose for the airplane was the result of a very careful and thorough evaluation of all of the high bypass ratio fans that were going to be available in this time period. Both Pratt & Whitney and General Electric in the United States were busily developing similar engines, and Rolls-Royce in the United Kingdom. Actually, we considered equally all three engines for the airplane. And it was a difficult choice to make. But the Rolls-Royce engine was a more advanced engine in its conceptual stages, and it still is a more advanced engine. The Rolls-Royce RB211 engine is, by design, one of the quietest engines that has been produced to date. It's also one of the cleanest because of some rather intricate details of the way the combustion uh, is arranged. We are trying to make it even quieter by uh, studying some very new and rather complex materials with which we can line the inside of the fan duct. Now the long road from the safety of sketches and specifications to the reality of flight must be traveled. The calculations, the tests, all say it can be done. Now the building of an airplane begins. From England came the engines, from Ireland the engine pods, from Tennessee the wings, from California the flight control system, from Texas the underwing pylons, from Canada the fuselage sub-assemblies, from Japan, the fuselage doors, from Illinois, hydraulic systems, from Ohio, 
wheels, tires, brakes. From Arizona, gyroscopes. From the hands and hearts and minds of hundreds of thousands of human beings, separated by the seas and the prairies and the mountains, joined now in common cause. It is over four years since actual work on the L-1011 began. The hours are beyond counting. The time spent in the pursuit of excellence beyond measurement. Finally, a great aircraft assumes shape and form. The first plane, prototype of the many that will follow, is made ready for flight. In 1903, two men stood in a field in North Carolina. For 12 seconds, they kept their flying machine 10 feet above the ground. In those 12 seconds, they wrote the preface to an age. This plane is longer than the entire distance covered by the Wright brothers' first flight. It is as high as a five-story building. When carrying fuel, baggage, and passengers, it will weigh over 200 tons. Each engine provides 42,000 pounds of thrust. The plane itself contains over 250,000 working parts. It will carry in comfort and safety over 250 passengers. It will range the heavens, cross a thousand suns in the course of its life. It is the reflection of the power of the mind of man. Another great step forward in the journey that began some 70 years ago on that field in North Carolina. It all started back in 1965 when Lockheed recognized that there was going to be a market for a new airplane. This was based upon market analyses that indicated uh, an increase of about 10 to 11 percent per year 
or approximately five times in the coming decade in commercial air travel. The airlines had been studying this problem themselves for some time, and in their planning departments they recognized the fact that they needed new aircraft. With this in mind, uh, funding was allocated for a quick look to see what the airplane might look like. Our initial studies were all for a twin-engine airplanes with a range of approximately uh, San Francisco to Chicago as the maximum. But the problem is an economic one. If you want to reduce the costs of flying a passenger in one seat, you have to put a lot of people in the box. And after a lot of studies, we decided that the airplane ought to have about 220 passengers in it. As time went on, and the airlines, including Eastern and other airlines, were studying the problem with us, they felt that they might want to use the airplane as sort of a backup to the 747 on night flights, for instance, and uh, they felt that the airplane ought to have a minimum capability to fly transcontinental. But if you study the problem from an engineer's viewpoint and you put 220 or 30 people in the box with two engines, remember now, if one engine fails, the other engine has to keep the airplane flying, and if he's over the Rocky Mountains, he has to maintain a minimum altitude. So as our design progressed, we decided to go to three engines instead of two. This permitted us to travel over greater ranges, to have a greater operational flexibility, and particularly permitted us to operate over water. Basically, the new airplane usually starts in preliminary design. This airplane had pretty much the same beginning, except that it had a, a totally different premise for its outcome than any other plane that I've ever worked on. Instead of operating the way we did in the past where the aerodynamicists and the propulsion people would put together a configuration and then they would give it to the interior design department and say now put some seats and some chairs in it and make it for passengers. This one went the other way around. They said let's design this first for people and we'll build the airplane around it. What really establishes the diameter of the fuselage? One of the factors is the serving tray width that, uh, that you have in front of you when you eat your meal on the airplane. I know it was important to us on the 1011 because we decided to install an underfloor galley in the airplane and prepare the food down there and serve it to the passenger in a cart. And the tray size thereby established the width of the cart. And we had to push the cart down the aisle and we had to have three or four inches to slide by the cart. So that established the width of the aisle. We had to make the seats at least as wide as the coach seats in the 747 or the passengers wouldn't have been satisfied. And when we decided on eight seats across the airplane, it really just added up to the total width of the airplane. The big thing that you have to shoot for is to make Airline Joe, the passenger, happy from the time he walks into that airplane and sits down and orders his first drink from the stewardess until he deplanes at his destination. And that's a task that the manufacturer and the airline share. And of course the airplane itself has to be a winner. The secret of good aerodynamic development is having a very good wind tunnel. And what we do in the wind tunnel, of course, is we develop the proper wing size, the airfoil shape, the sweep angle, the uh, configuration of the front end of these big fuselages and the back end. We measure the control effectiveness and we size the tail and we establish the balance for the airplane. And we bet our, <laughs> we really bet our whole future on our knowledge of the accuracy of that wind tunnel. There is an interesting gap between the design of an airplane. What for? Basically so they can hopefully minimize their losses, so they can provide employment for 31,000 people throughout this country at a time when we desperately need that type of employment. That's basically the rationale and the justification. Well, exactly. That's a welfare rationale. It, it, precisely as we, we, give, uh, we give food stamps to a family that's hungry because we don't want them to starve. We want their children to have something to eat. Those strongly opposed to any government aid to the embattled company clashed with men who were deeply concerned with the effect on so many thousands of lives. ...of a viable major business enterprise should be avoided if it is a temporary situation 
that can be alleviated at small risk to the government. We've also carefully... At this critical moment, the cause of the L-1011 received vital support from key airline customers whose faith in the aircraft was stronger than ever. An intensive re-evaluation by these customers had only served to reinforce their confidence in both plane and engine. In face of the most difficult odds, they stood committed and moved to join Lockheed in the effort to assure the future of the aircraft. Over many months, the argument continues and the question remains, will the L-1011 ever enter service? situation that we're wrestling with. Finally, the future of this plane is decided. Go. The word is go. The L-1011 will now go forward to completion. Within a year, it will enter the service of the great airlines of the world. Now begins the final investigation into this aircraft. Gone is conjecture. Theory is a thing of the past. The models and simulations are complete. This is flight. We had a takeoff time of 14.30, approximately 325,000 pounds, and a cool day at Palmdale of 101 degrees Fahrenheit. High in the heavens it will be pushed far beyond the limits of anything it will encounter in all the years of its commercial service. It must fly perfectly, safely, surely. The work of six years is on the line. Don, you, you were making or handling the airplane at that time. You want to comment, please? Well, yes, we uh, attempted a locked uh, draw of climb from 20 to 30, I believe. Uh, I think we started at about 20,500. 280 knots, and uh, looks like we've got a little more work, uh, Chris, in this area yet. I think the fuel control can, uh, it, we had to reset the power uh, uh, at least once. During these months, countless van hours will be invested as the quality and endurance of the L-1011 are tested. Higher, faster than it will ever have to fly. When we can get a little bit more out of here, and they're going to tweak the APU a little bit more on that before the next flight. It will be subjected to stresses and strains in an attempt to reveal any weakness, any point of possible failure. Tens of thousands of feet over the earth, the L-1011 will prove itself, and it will pay tribute to those who dared to dream. We're on airplane this time, and... Uh... With these accelerations, it was just a little hard to keep up with the airplane and the rear pedals. <laughs> because the isometric thrust condition XL diesel situation. The pilots and engineers will prove in flight and afterward every working part of this machine. Inside the plane during flight, they will read and interpret the results from a thousand sensitive instruments. They will listen for every murmur, every sound. They will seek out the silent and the invisible. They will report their findings. They will argue and debate changes and improvements. They will demand a perfection beyond perfection. For this is a field of battle upon which this plane must succeed or fail. The mass fuel counter on engine three in the AO was sticking a bit and tended to lag a bit behind the weight station. But I can update you on it. The L-1011, a joining together of man's creative imagination and technical skills. And when it is all done, they will know what kind of plane this is.
it began deep within the recesses of the human mind. It called forth the commitment of thousands of craftsmen, engineers, technicians, and pilots, all those concerned with its creation. It is an airplane designed for people. Its interior cabins create a sense of comfort, intimacy, and warmth that add a new dimension to the experience of flight. It is an aircraft that meets the needs of our time. Its engines are cleaner and quieter than any ever designed. serve well the millions who will travel the skyways of this world.